Uh, the work I've been doing is usually being done in collaboration with a bunch of people. The most, the major ones are listed there. So uh, my plan is the following. I'll, uh, I'll start with neutrino astrophysics. That won't take very long for reasons which you should understand. I get into then the astronomical counterparts of ice cube neutrino. Ice cube is the largest neutrino detector in the world. And then and get to the, I guess, the part which are, you are more interested in the synergy with the very energy astrophysics, of course, and the role of CTA. But as uh, Roberta said, I work at ESO, and as you all know, the CTA South will be uh, uh, managed by ESO. This is uh, where it's supposed to be. This is in this circle there. It's close to uh, Cerro Paraná, where our four <clears throat> very large telescopes are located. And also close to Cerro Amazon, it's where the extreme -less telescope, which is going to be the largest optical near infrared uh, telescope in the world, is going to be. So it's here, it's on this plateau. This is a picture I took last time I was in Paraná uh, on the road going back up to, uh, to, to, to the VLT. So this is where uh, CTA, so there is a strong link already between ESO and, uh, and then CTA. Uh, just to make sure we are all in the same, on the same wavelength, uh, actually on the same frequency, I, I should say. I report here the classical you know, notation. I'm going to be using uh, EV, GV, tera electron volt, beta electron volt, and so forth. So <clears throat> I know you're familiar with it, but just, just to be on the safe side. So um, neutrinos, I guess many, most astronomers are not familiar with neutrinos, so I'll have a slide dedicated to those. Uh, first of all, neutrinos are Italian. The name neutrino, was coined in, uh, in Rome, actually by, by Eduardo Maldi, uh, last century. This is a picture of the famous ragazzi di Dio Panisperna, the Panisperna boys, where actually, uh, you know, uh, physics, uh, there was a very uh, important group doing uh, top physics in Rome. The name was then popularized by Fermi, and it means, simply means little neutral one, to be distinguished from the neutrone, which was the big uh, neutral one. So it's tiny, that's the, why it's neutrino, because it's small. Uh, the latest upper limit comes, uh, was released uh, actually a couple, uh, last week, I think a couple of weeks ago, it's 0.8 electron volts. So uh, that's about uh, 600, 640,000 times smaller than the mass of the electron. And I remind you what the value of, is that. So it's really, really, really small. Uh, it's neutral. It's a very weakly interacting elementary particle. And uh, they, it comes in three types, the electron, the muon, and the tau neutrino, which to make our life complicated, they actually uh, can switch between one uh, uh, flavor, as they are called, and the other. And the most important thing is that neutrinos are actually absolutely everywhere. When I give my public talks, people are uh, shocked by this, but it's true. Every cubic centimeter of the universe contains about 340 cosmic neutrinos, with energy which is which is really, really small. This comes from the Big Bang when everything was in equilibrium, neutrinos as well. We probably never be able to detect them, but they are there. And then every second, every square centimeter of our skin is crossed by about 10 to the 11 solar neutrinos, which means that every second we are crossed by 10 to the 14 neutrinos with an energy slightly less than one mega volt. So they are really absolutely everywhere. So they could be the second most common particle in the universe, uh, apart from dark matter, but we, I still we don't know what dark matter is. Just to give you a flavor, again, this, is, this is comes from one of my public talks, but I think it gives you a nice uh, idea. If I shoot one of these solar neutrinos in, in a pipe, this is the, the uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, aqueduct. If I shoot a neutrino in the pipe, how long is it going to take for the neutrino to stop on average? The answer is 500 parsecs. So this shows you how very little neutrinos interact with matter. If I shoot a proton with the same energy, after half a meter, the proton is stopped. So these are really, really weakly interacting particles. So neutrino astronomy, as I said, is going to be take very, very little because until recently, we only knew two neutrino sources in the universe. The first one is the sun. This is a paper from the Borexino collaboration, which highlights the classical uh, fusion reaction, which happens in the sun constantly. Four protons merge in a very complicated way. They become an atom of helium. They produce energy, of course, which is what uh, us astronomers love, but they also produce two positrons and two electron neutrinos. And the, the energy of this um, neutrino, which comes to the so-called PP channel, as you can see here, which is about half of an mega electron volt. 
The second and last until recently source was Supernova H7A. I was still a graduate student when a supernova, the closest supernova uh, to Earth since many, many centuries, exploded in the night Magellanic Magellan cloud. A few hours before the optical photons, three different unit detectors on Earth detected a bunch of neutrinos with energies between 20 to 40 mega electron volts. How they are they produced? It's so, the so-called uh, reverse uh, beta decay. During the core collapse, protons and electrons are squashed to death, and they produce a, a neutron and an electron neutron. So totally different physics than the solar neutrinos. Enter ice cubes. Ice cube in 2013 published the first paper on science saying that they detected a bunch of astrophysical neutrinos above 30 tera electron volt. So this is already a million times higher than the energy of the supernova neutrinos. Uh, what is ice cube? Ice cube, first of all, as I said, is the largest neutrino detector in the world. It's the South Pole. You don't see it because it's under the ice. It was built over seven summers by uh, using uh, boiling hot water to, to dig all these, um, these um, tunnels, where, uh, where, which were used then to lower the detectors of ice cube, which go down to about 2,500 meters. They, get, they reach the bedrock underneath the ice. So what ice cube does, it doesn't actually see the neutrinos. It sees the interactions of particles produced by the interaction of neutrinos with the protons in the ice, which produce muons, which produce Cherenkov blue light, a bit like uh, uh, CTA will detect. And it detects this light thanks to these uh, um, optical modules. So based on the way these modules flash, uh, the ice cube physicist tells us the direction and the energy of the neutrinos. Uh, this is a, a, a one a more recent uh, result. This is now 2019. The level of detection has reached now 6.5 sigma, which I remind you for physicists is really great. They have this five sigma detection, which is really, really hard to get, but now they are 6.5 sigma. They are sure they detect these two physical neutrinos. And uh, as of now, uh, above uh, this range of about 50 tera electron volt, where actually we know that we are almost sure that the neutrino, the neutrino astrophysics, astrophysical, because there are also some astro atmospheric neutrinos produced by cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. Above this value, uh, we can say that the uh, ice cube is detected about uh, a couple of hundred of astrophysical neutrinos. So now, do we know? Have we gone from two neutrino sources to 200? Unfortunately not. And the reason is, this is shown here. The error circles of this neutrino is huge. Uh, these events come in two flavors. The showers, which actually can have radii up to 10, 15 degrees, and trucks, which are actually well more um, better determined. These are the small circles here, uh, with areas uh, of, uh, say, uh, with radius about up to one, 1.5 degrees. So it's very hard to understand, to know where they're coming from. But if you look at the distribution in galactic coordinates, you see that this is the galactic plane. They are all over the place. So they are not coming from the galaxy. Indeed, the majority of these uh, neutrinos is coming from other galaxies. And this is a zoomed in of uh, the first um, association which I'll discuss uh, in, in a few minutes. So we know that they're coming from other galaxies. And another hint we can use to understand where they're coming from is the energies. As I said earlier, nuclear fusion, fusion produces neutrinos up to 1 MeV. Supernova explosion, beta, uh, reverse beta decay up to 10, 20 mega electron volts. The, the neutrinos seen by ice cube now reach 6 peta electron volt. Okay, that's a billion times higher than the neutrinos from the supernova explosion. So where are these coming from? We know it's due to protons, high energy protons colliding with protons or with photons, producing pions, which decay, produce muons, and also uh, uh, neutrinos. The same reaction produces pi zeros up here, which produces gamma rays. And the energy and the flux of the gamma rays and the neutrinos are within uh, the same within a factor of two. So this is a very important point. 
all neutrino sources have to be gamma ray sources. Intrinsically, I say because the gamma rays could be absorbed, but intrinsically, they have to be gamma ray sources. Of course, the opposite is not true. You can have gamma ray sources produced in different ways, which are not neutrino sources. But if you have neutrinos, you have to have high energy protons, you have to have gamma rays. And this is one of the things, one of the, the hints we've been using to try to make a way and understand where, where are, what are the astronomical counterparts. So let's get to the first uh, um, plausible association. This goes back to uh, September 2017, so now uh, four and a half years ago. Uh, Ice Cube releases every now and then uh, um, circulars where uh, they alert the community to uh, interesting neutrinos and they give the position and the inner circle. In this case, this happened as I said, September 2017. The energy was quite high, almost uh, 300 electron volts. And what happened was that at the same time, Fermi and Magic detected a counterpart, which was a blazer flaring in the gamma rays. I'll tell you what the blazers are in a second. Uh, these are the light curves. You see the, 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 the Fermi gamma ray light curve closer to the event of the neutrino, which is this, this red line. The source is starting to be in outburst also in the radio and in other bands. So how likely is it that you actually connect such a neutrino with a flaring uh, blazer? So uh, this, the calculation was done in the science paper by Ice Cube uh, and, and all the many collaborations which were actually part of the paper. And the result was that based on uh, various arguments, the p-value was between 3 and 3.5 sigma. This is post-trial, of course. Physicists use post-trial uh, values, which means that you know it, it, astronomers, uh, they're starting to do it, but uh, we normally don't do it. If you do uh, 20 tests, you get by chance a 2 sigma result, because 1 over 20 is 0.05. So when you do many, many tests, your p-value has to multiply by the number of tests to correct for that. So this is corrected for that, and already still it is 3 to 3.5 sigma. But there is more. Uh, the Ice Cube collaboration went back to the archive and they realized that there was a flare of neutrinos, about 13 neutrinos coming from the same region over 110 days at the end of October 2014. The energy range was again very high, 13 teletron volt to 3.6 petaletron volt. And again, the p value post trial of the coincidence was 3.5 sigma. So there were two sort of independent events. One was one neutrino and the other one was about 13 neutrinos, all coming from the same source. The source, which was very anonymous at, at, at the time, now has become very popular. It's Texas 0506, plus 056. Texas means that it comes from the Texas survey, which is a radio catalog. That's, that's all it means. It was now with the with a, with a Texas, uh, uh, with a radio telescope in Texas. It's, this is an optical spectrum. Um, as you can see, there is not much. If you exclude the telluric absorptions and interstellar bands, there are three tiny, very weak lines, which I zoomed in here. Oxygen 2, oxygen 3, and nit nitrogen 2. Based on this, Piano et al. managed to get the redshift, which is 0 0.3365. Um, the equivalent width, which in astronomy we defined as the ratio between the line flux and the continuum flux, was very, very small. 0.05 to 0.17 Oxygen. Trust me, for astronomers, this is really, really weak. So if I hadn't seen, I've seen only one line, I would trust the rest, but they found three. So I'm very, very confident about the rest, which is vital if you want to do the physics, because then with the physics, you can do the powers and can actually, you can actually model the sources. And this is a, a point I'll get to uh, in a minute when I talk about our own work. So this source was a blazer. What is a blazer? So I give you, I give you the big, the big picture. We know about two trillion galaxies in the universe, uh, more or less. We believe that most of them, the big ones, have black holes at the center. But in many cases, the black holes are absolutely doing nothing. Like in our, in our galaxy, our galaxy, the black hole is dormant, is sitting there. There is no gas falling to it. Yeah, you can see it by other means, but it's, it's really doing nothing. In about ten percent of the cases. The nucleus at the center, you can see this is NC4151, becomes active. We call them active galactic nuclei or AGM. Why? Because matter falling on the black hole, pulled in by the, by, by, by the potential of the black hole, converts its gravitational energy into radiation, and the, a lot of power is emitted. In about 
let's say 10% of the cases, jets are developed. These are streams of particles moving close to the speed of light. When these jets are pointed towards us, and this is the famous picture that um, Roberta was referring to, which is now uh, about 27 years old the next month. <laughs> and when the blazer is pointed to the jet is pointed towards us, we call the source a blazer. And by that I mean within 10, 15 degrees. You do the math, it turns out that about one galaxy out of 100,000 is a blazer. So it's a very, very rare class but they are very, very powerful. So they are actually uh, dominating some parts of the sky, including the radio and also the gamma ray and the very energy gamma ray, the CTA is going to be sampled, sampling. Why are bases important? Because there are, of course, sites of very energy phenomena. Again, this is very related to CTA. So far, we, we detected photons up to 20 electron volts from them and the speed of the jets reaches 0.9998C, that's the Lorentz factor of 50. How do we know that? We know because we study them in the radio and we see these blobs moving with time. We know the distance. We can infer how fast they're moving. Turns out they're moving faster than light, which doesn't make any sense. But it's a selection effect because the source is running after its own photons. Time is compressed. If you do the math properly and you put in the orientation angle, you can actually infer from the superluminal motion, as we call it, the real motion, and it turns out to be up to Lorentz factor of 50. So no, not, no, nothing is violating uh, special relativity here. There is also, as I said, uh, based on this, we know that there is relativistic beaming, which means jets moving very fast at a small angle with the line of sight. And thanks to this, there is amplification, and so uh, the jets in blazer, they look much, much more brighter than they are because uh, of this uh, boosting, which turns out that it's produced by relativistic beaming and it goes like double factor to some power and blah, 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 this is very, very well known. My definition is that natures are free, natures, uh, blazers are nature's free accelerators and they're very efficient. Free in the sense that it's cheaper to look at the blazer than to build a large Hadronic Collider on a CERN. So you actually can study accelerators by studying blazers, which means, which explains why many physicists actually have moved into, have moved into blazer territories to be able to study these this, this, uh, free accelerators. So 2017, as I said, was four and a half years ago. What happened since then? I'm going to give you a summary because the literature is very is full of complicated uh, claims. And so I've done my own selection, very biased, uh, because you know I've been working in the, in the field. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what happened since then and what we know now about possible other um, nuclear resources. First of all, um, there is a 2.9 sigma detection, so almost three sigma, from guess what? A cipher 2, NGC 1068. Totally different beast. It's the prototype Cipher 2 galaxy, it's obscured. And uh, apparently, okay, although the physicist would say this is not a detection, it's uh, a hint. Uh, if there is a 2. Point, it's a 2.9 sigma. Uh, then there is a 3.3 sigma combined excess in the lone sky, which when you do, when you look carefully, is due to four sources. One is again 1068, and then there are three blazers. One is our friend, 0506, and then there are two other. Anonymous blazer, 1424 and 1542. And then there is a 3.0 sigma time dependent excess now in the known sky again, due to again to NGC 68, again 0506, uh, another blazer, 1542, the same one there, and M87, which is Paolo and Johnny and I call it almost a blazer because it's jet, it's a very strong source, and it's uh, aligned within 17 degrees with the line of sight, let's say 1720. So it's almost a blazer. How did the, uh, how did the ice cube uh, get these uh, p-values? What they do, they look for clustering of photons. This is a, a map, a sky map of their, uh, their many events. They look for clusters and they look for excess over the background. The two circles here show you the, the, the strongest northern and southern uh, 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 sources. Now, if I go back and highlight the, the names of the sources, you see blazers all over the place. Apart from the 68, you see that there are 
Uh, three blazers here, two blazers here, and then there is a mid circle, which I said is almost the base. So this is this were results from ice cube. Then there are other results from the literature. One comes from our own group, a paper from by Paolo Johnny and uh, myself and others. What we found, we found the 3.2 sigma correlation post-trial again uh, for 47 gamma ray blazers. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss this in a minute, but these were a particular, a particular type of blazers. We call them IBS and HPS. What is that? Uh, this is based on the frequency of the synchrotron peak. This is a classical blazer ACD. This is BLA, the prototype. As you can see, this is frequency, and this is nu of nu, or the square DNDE for the physicist. There is a first peak, uh, which is the, due to synchrotron emission, and then there is a synchrotron peak, and another peak, sorry, high energies, where, which we don't know uh, what is due to. And uh, based on the frequency of, this, of the peak of the synchrotron emission, uh, we call sources HPL, like Bacaria 501, which has a, a, a frequency reaching almost 10 to the 20 when it gets in numbers, or intermediate when the peak is about 10 to the 14. Why we are interested mostly in the, in the sources, especially the HPS, because as you can see from Macaria 501, when you shift the secretal peak, the whole SED is get shifted to extremely high energy. So this is very relevant also to CTA. These are the sources the CTA is mostly going to detect. Um, then there is uh, another result, a 2.9 sigma correlation in excess for VLPI selected AGM. These are sources which show a very strong radio core. The four byte associations, again, are all blazers, but they appear to be LBS. Single peak is below than the 14 hertz. Another type of sigma correlation is for the same um, AGM sample, but for a different SQ sample. And then there is a 2.6 sigma association within five neutrinos seen by Antares, which is a northern detector in the Mediterranean Sea and the nice cube event, and they both appear to be linked to another place. So let me a few words about uh, the John Newton uh, result. What we did, we looked, we dissected, uh, we said the regions around um, uh, about 70 uh, ice cube events. These are, this is their projection in, uh, in the equatorial coordinates. We only looked at the tracks. These are the ones which, uh, whose position is best, best determined. And uh, in blue are the sources which included the red ones are in the galactic plane, which gets confusing, so we dropped them. This shows you how complicated this is. This is one of the good ones. This is one of the good neutrino uh, 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 error ellipses, okay? So the, the size here is about slightly more than one degree. All these red dots are radio sources. All the blue dots are X-ray sources. And there are, you know, hundreds of them inside. If you only look at the radio and the X-rays, you move to the right of the plot, and the numbers go down immensely. We're looking for non-thermal sources. Non-thermal sources emit in the radio, the X-rays, and also the gamma rays. So this is what we did. We looked for radio, X-ray, and gamma ray sources within these NO regions, and we got a bunch of, the, of associations, okay? We got about 47 of them, and the interesting part is that we did it for two, class of places. We did it for the LBS, so single peak less than for 10, 14 hertz. And then we did the, 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 the we did a match. We, we counted how many blazers we found with this, this 70 uh, error ellipses. And then we, Paolo Giombi did an amazing work. He took a, ran, a random number of uh, regions in the sky and looked for the same type of sources. And he got the same numbers, you can see. In, in the neutrino region, we got 15. In the control sample, we got 14. Here, 17, here, 20, 24, 26. But when you look at the IBL and HPL, so synchrotron peak about under 14 hertz, we got an excess. In the neutrino region, we got more sources, significantly more, 3.2 sigma, than in the control sample. Don't worry about the, the various uh, uh, numbers here. The point is that uh, ice cube publishes a 90% error circle, but we know that there are systematic. So what we did, we increased this error circle by 1.1, 1.3, 1.5 to be sure that we are not missing sources. Anyway, the bottom line is that we find an excess of about 15 gamma ray blazers on top of the background at the 3.2 sigma level. And some of them are like 
Texas is of ideal sticks in ways which I'll explain in a minute. So again, summarizing again these other results, nothing to do with ice cube, you see blazers all over the place. Okay, other IBL and HBL, like in our case, or LBS, but blazers are, appear to come out as possible counterparts. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's still, you know, 2.9, 3.23, we're still there. I mean, so physicists, again, are saying these are hints, they're not detections. So what is the take home messages? Uh, we're missing the, the, the you know, the, the, the magical five sigma, unfortunately. We have a bunch of three sigma associations. Blazers are all over the place, but the rest there are hints that only blazers are very rare. Uh, and rare blazers are classes are actually involved. And this is, comes most from our group. As I said, IBL or HPA, or, uh, and HPS, so blazers where the, the signal peak is above 10 to the 14 hertz, which actually makes sense because us and, and the ice cube group put an upper limit on the signal that they can explain, uh, the blazers can actually explain in terms of ice cube uh, events, and it's about up to 15, 30%. So blazers, yes, are popping up all the time, but they cannot be explaining all of the ice cube signal. There is something else going on there. So what are we doing now? Uh, I get to CTA in a minute. So we have 47 sources which are uh, detected, uh, con possibly connected with neutrinos. About 15 of them should be detected. And so we started a, a project um, uh, where actually I work at ESO, by work also on energy, where ESO and then the Grand Tecan in this case have uh, made ice cream. Why? Uh, why? Because only thanks to optical telescope, this is uh, uh, our BLTs, uh, Cerro Paranal, and this is the Grand Telescope of Canales. Only by getting optical spectra and getting redshifts, you can get the powers, you can actually get the physics of the sources, and you can understand what's going on. So most of the sources uh, selected by John Metal didn't have redshift. So we started a, a project to actually uh, get redshift of the sources. We published a bunch of papers, paper one, led by Simona Payano and her group, published uh, a bunch of spectra of the sources. And the good news is for all the sources we looked at, this is the table of our paper, we either got redshifts with very good significance or lower limits. So we can actually tell you either the redshifts or a lower limit to the redshift, which means you can get the power of the source, gamma ray, neutrino, whatever, or a lower limit to the power. Based on this, we actually launched another paper, which was uh, which appeared uh, on uh, uh, online uh, uh, last December, where we actually characterized all these sources, trying to look for uh, features which were distinguish them from other blazers. And the answer at the moment is that they seem to be quite similar to the blazer, apart from one thing, which has to do with the, again our Texas 0506, which. Uh, the, most of the sources are masquerading BLX, and I introduce what I mean in one second. So, after the detection in 2017, uh, the big question at the time was, why of the 5,000 blazers we know, is Ice Cube possibly detected only this one? And so we and others started to try to understand if this source was special, and indeed it was, at least from our point of view. We published a paper uh, uh, one year later, where we actually show that despite appearances, uh, this source was not a BLAC. What do I mean? I mean this, blazers come in two flavors, BLACs on the left with optical spectra, which are, as you see from the original uh, discovery spectrum of the source, they have nothing. They have very little lines uh, or very weak emission lines. And then there are the flat spectrum quasars, which are quasars, so they have strong lines, like the first quasar we have discovered, then the zillion to be discovered since very, very strong magnesium to H alpha and beta lines. Uh, with, uh, to me, according to me and Paolo John, me, there are unfortunately, well, fortunately, two types of BLACs. There are the real BLACs where the lines are intrinsically weak. So uh, the equivalent width, which is again the ratio between the line flux and the continuum, is small because the line flux is very weak. This BLAX sits in so-called low excitation galaxies, which are uh, very inefficient creatures. This, this picture comes from Ekerman and Best. 
The, on the left, you see the standard view of AGN. You see the black hole, the accretion disk, clouds moving very fast across the black hole and, and show, displaying broad lines, uh, some dusty material forming it's like a, a torus, a jet. This is what we, the AGN we know and love. On the right, you see this low excitation things. Uh, we think there is something else going on. They don't have a standard Sakura Sunayev uh, disk. They have a school advection dominated accretion flow. And uh, uh, there are no broad lines. So we believe the real BLX sit in low excitation galaxies. And there are the fake BLX, which we call masquerading BLX. These sources intrinsically have a spectrum, which is like a blaze, a, a fast spectrum quasar. But the jet is so strong that the equivalent width, which is again the ratio between the line flux and the continuum, is small because the, the, the denominator in this case is very large. So they are, these are intrinsically fast spectrum quasars, but the lines are strong. And the way this can happen is shown here. And by the way, so, and we show the Texas 056 is a masquerading real lack. So it, it actually is a fast spectrum quasars, but the lines are very weak because the jet is very, very strong. And this is why this happened can be shown in this simulation, which goes back to an old paper of mine, led by an excellent of mine, Minelan. This shows you an elliptical galaxy, standard elliptical, on top of which we put a jet, a non-thermal jet. And these numbers here give you the ratio between the jet and the galaxy at 5,500 um, 5, 5, ohms. As you can see, already when the jet is uh, three times higher or 10 times higher, this, the, the features are gone. By the time you are, you are 15, 20, your, your features are gone. The same thing is happening here. We have, you have a fast spectrum quasar, very, very strong jet, which is washing eye out all the lines. And then th that's why it's called it's a masculine BLX. Many of the BLX in Paolo Giomi's paper and others' papers are masquerading. Why is this interesting? But well, theorists love this because remember how you get neutrinos in the sources? You have protons mashing against other protons or photons. If you have a masquerade in the lag on top of the photons in the jet, you have also the photons in the disk. So this, in theory, should be more efficient neutrino emitters. And we found more. Uh, remember that uh, this past 1424 and 1542, they were popping up in this list from ice cube all the time. There's a paper which appeared on, on, on archive uh, two weeks ago. We study them, and again, they are also masquerading. Okay, 1424, UPCs 1542, Texas 05. So far, all three of the blazers, which I have indicated as possible neutrino emitters, are masquerading. So this, we think, is meaning something. Okay, you don't work on neutrinos. So at this point, you're asking yourself, why should I care? Well, you should, especially UCTA people, you should. Because new neutrinos are actually giving us a window, we are, with them we are exploding an energy range, which is and will always be inaccessible with photons at any ratio. Which means basically that neutrinos are giving us a new window on very high astrophysics. Why is that? Because of the very famous EBL, extra-relative background light. As you can see from here, you have a photon coming from a distant blazer, it interacts with this UV optical infrared photos, which make up the extra light background light. This is the sum of the emission from all the galaxies in the universe, and it gets attenuated, photon photon uh, collision. So if you are nearby, you get a small attenuation. If you are distant, if you are you're, you're attenuated a lot, but if you are high energy, you are totally attenuated. And um, the, the, the cross section is maximum when the target of the energy goes like one over E gamma. Where e gamma is the energy of the gamma ray photon. So if you have a 100 TV gamma ray photon, of course, one which could be seen by, by CTA, it will interact with photons in the infrared background, will be completely destroyed. And this is a nice picture from one of the ISQ papers, which shows you. The, uh, the photon horizon as a function of energy. So here we have tera electron volt, beta electron volt, x electron volt. And as you can see, by the time you reach the tera electron volt or more, you basically are bound to very, very small distances, 
One, you are at the petal electron volt, you're basically bound to the galaxy. So the only way to study this high energy phenomena is through neutrinos. Uh, cosmic rays, as you can see them uh, um, uh, appear, they are related as well. Uh, so neutrinos are relevant for this mystery as well, but as cosmic rays, they are not cosmic rays at all. They are particles were discovered by Victor Hess last century by flying a, a balloon uh, to very, very high uh, uh, altitudes. They are the most energetic things we know in the universe. This is a plot where they are flux as a function of energy. So you see giga, giga electron volt, electron volt, petal electron volt, here you see CTA, here you see the, the large electron collider, here you see ice cube. They reach the, into the extra electron volt regime, which is a thousand petal electron volt, and the record holds is actually 320 extra electron volt. So these are uh, particles, they are charged, they are nuclei of atoms or protons, and by studying the neutrinos in the Tesla 0506 source, now we know that we've seen that the, the, there has to be protons in the, in the jet of the source in this, uh, in this region. So for the first time, we might associate some cosmic rays uh, with an astronomical source in this region, not, with the, not down here, unfortunately, but, but only but, but this. So we are in the era, as, as, as we all know, of multi-metrics astrophysics. So you have a jet, uh, which is shooting towards us, and it shoots uh, uh, cosmic rays, which are charged, unfortunately, so they are deflected by magnetic fields. And so it, they reach um, uh, Earth coming from all different directions. So it's, very, it's impossible to know where they're coming from, or very hard, at least. You have the photons, which above a certain energy, they are totally absorbed, and then neutrinos. Neutrinos manage to come straight to us uh, unimpeded with the energy that they had. And so this is the only way at high energies to make sense of all these sources. So what's, uh, what are the open issues? And then I get to the, to the synergies. Uh, as I said, we still don't have a smoking gun, although I'm totally convinced that blazers have to do with, uh, uh, with the, the, the neutrinos from Ice Cube. Blazers have to be involved, as I said, but other classes actually should be as well. Uh, another open issue is that we still don't know after you know Ygritte, so so uh, 30 or more years, what is producing the gamma ray emissions in blazers? And still we don't know, we don't have any hard evidence of high energy protons in these sources. Why? Because there are too many ways to, to produce uh, the gamma ray photos, which you all know a lot. This is Macaria photo one, uh, an SED put together by, by Paolo Giomi. You see the very strong exit variability, and then you see a very high variability also in the in the very high energy band. We still don't know which processes are producing these photons. There are two options. One is uh, uh, to do with single radiation. As I said, uh, in blazers, we know that the low energy, you have electrons moving in magnetic field, moving very fast, produce single radiation. The same electrons are pushing uh, the, pro the photons they produce to very, energy, uh, to very high energy through the so-called inverse component emission. These are called leptonic models because electrons are leptons. And then there, are the other, um, there is the other scenario, which again, I've shown you already. It's proton-proton collision, proton-photon collision. In this case, uh, the, the gammas come from the decay of pi zeros, and these are called hadronic models. In this case, you have to have neutrinos. Uh, why can't we know? The, the, the reason is that because you can fit the energy uh, SED of places with the two different models equally well. These are uh, SEDs. Uh, the data are uh, these points uh, uh, in in in, uh, in red here. Uh, there are the different states: quiescent, hard flare, soft flare. Uh, they are done in different ways. On the left, you have laptop learning models. On the right, you have proton synchrotron models. And uh, uh, this is for a, a blazer passing five fifteen zero two. And you can fit equally well with the two different scenarios what data data actually you can see. And this is from one of your papers, state collaboration, which shows again uh, uh, inverse Compton in, on the right, so leptonic scenario, which can explain the current data, which are the red points. And on the, on the left, you have an hadronic scenario, which can explain equally well the current data, which are the, the, the black points. So at present, for this source, we cannot say, is it hadronic or is it leptonic? The red squares, of course, are CTA simulations. And there, you can see that 
If it's hadronic, we'll have the CTA the points. If it's electronic, we have the CTA points. And so there, given the, 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 the high energy range, the small error bus, there we'll be able to nail absolutely the, 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 the scenario behind the high energy emission in, uh, uh, in blazes. And more was done. Uh, uh, why is it relevant for blazers? Uh, other reasons, of course. At the moment, 89% of all extragalactic sources detected the TV are blazers. For each of which I said earlier, because blazers are very good high energy emitters. But the way these things have been detected is very, very strange uh, and not very representative. What happens is that this uh, um, magic uh, has uh, validators are not very sensitive, so they look at the blazer only when they are in outburst. So there is a, a telegram saying there is an outburst in the optical, in the excellent in the blazer, then they point the telescopes to the source and they see them in outburst. This gives us a very uh, biased and patchy uh, view of high energy emission in blazers. CTA will give us a systematic approach and detect 10 times more blazers than, uh, uh, than we can do uh, right now. And with Paulo Jomi uh, a couple of years ago, no, sorry, a few years ago, we actually did this. We simulated uh, what CTA should be able to see based on our uh, own, own model of blazers. And we know we published tables and numbers and based on the type of survey, we know that CTA is going to see many, many blazers and, 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 and give us throw light on high energy emission from these sources. I'm done, uh, 48 minutes. So uh, what are the points you need to take home? Uh, number one, we are witnessing the birth of extra galactic internal story. So it's a very special time. Uh, until recently, we only knew two Latino uh, sources in the universe, the sun and the supernova. Now we have many potential ones, but we still don't know what they are. There are various sigma associations, largely with places. We need five sigma or more. We are working hard to test the blazer case because we know that the blazers have to be, well, we know, we think, we feel blazers are actually involved. And we're doing it using, you know, optical uh, spectra with ISO and Tanteca. The other message to you to bring home, for you to bring home is that with the Venus, we have a new window, a unique window of very high energy astrophysics and energy which will be forever accessible with photons. And then CTA actually is going to be invaluable to finally prove or disprove the existence of high energy protons, so hadronic processes in blazers, and also give us an unbiased view of their TV properties. And with this, I'm done. Thank you very much.